uh, the plan that I have for this course. Uh, we will be covering uh, different periods of the British literature, starting from Old English. Uh, then we'll move forward to Middle English. Then, you know, chronologically, the Renaissance, the Neoclassical period, the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, enlightenment or age of reason as it is called uh, moving on to romantic uh, the uh, era of Wordsworth and Coleridge and then Victorian era modernism and then eventually with modernism and the contemporary uh, literature so um, this is the history of the English language uh, this is going to make more sense to you after the end uh, you know of the session so, you know, in this uh, specific session, I will be picking up a discussion of Old English. Uh, if you see here, so this actually, you know, uh, this uh, charts the progress of English literature, English language, and the different influences that went into the making of English that we have today. All right, so don't just get intimidated uh, by this uh, image. It might seem a little too much at this point, but as uh, as and when we progress, this is going to make more sense to you guys. Okay, so just hang in there. We're we're you know just about to have a fun ride. Okay, so you know a very basic difference. Uh, there is difference between England, Great Britain, United Kingdom, and you know these terms are uh, you know very conveniently interchangeably uh, used, but uh, you know in reality they have different uh, connotations. When uh, you know, anybody says England, uh, that means this part, as you can see, this, uh, the nation here, England, it only refers to this part. All right. Uh, Great Britain, on the other hand, uh, includes Scotland that lies to the north of England and also Wales that lies to the west, uh, southwest, right? Of this whole, uh, you know, together Scotland, Wales, and England, they are they are called the Great Britain. All right, and then uh, we, uh, and if we are referring, uh, if we are talking about United Kingdom, that would be, you know, this part. You include Northern uh, England, uh, sorry, Northern Ireland to this whole mix of Scotland, England, and Wales, and you get United Kingdom. So that leaves uh, with us Republic of Ireland. That is a separate nation. All right. So whenever somebody says England, that means only this part. And when somebody says Great Britain, that means this part in totality. Right. Scotland, Wales and England. And when somebody says United Kingdom, that includes Northern Ireland to the mix. All right. I hope this much is clear to everybody. And together, all of this, uh, the collection of islands, this is called the Brit British Isles. Right. So very important. Uh, I think all the literature students must know the difference between, uh, you know, these, these usages. So, uh, since we will also be referring to, you know, France here, because even uh, France has a lot of, uh, has, you know, a lot of role to play uh, in shaping of English language and, and you know, the social political uh, circumstances um, of England uh, in the old uh, period especially. So, uh, you know, I want you to take a notice of uh, this place. Can you see it here? Normandy. This is towards the west of uh, Paris, right? Just take a note on uh, the location of uh, Normandy. And this is United Kingdom. So France lies to the south of UK, south of England. Okay. So just take note of it. I will be coming back to this point at a later point. So quickly moving on to a very interesting video that, that will, you know, launch you into this, this whole discussion of how, you know, English language, uh, you know, it grew with time, certain influences uh, got injected into it. What exactly happened to English from where it began and, you know, the whole course of its changes and, you know, adding up of influences and, you know, building building up of different influences and the way we have it today, right? So, a quick video for everybody to watch.
I'm going to start with a challenge. I want you to imagine each of these two scenes in as much detail as you can. Scene number one, they give us a hearty welcome. Well, who are the people who are giving a hearty welcome? What are they wearing? What are they drinking? Okay, scene two, they gave us a cordial reception. How are these people standing? What expressions are on their faces? What are they wearing and drinking? Fix these things in your mind's eye and then jot down a sentence or two to describe them. We'll come back to them later. Now on to our story. In the year 400 CE, the Celts and Romans were ruled by Romans. This had one benefit for the Celts. The Romans protected them from the barbarian Saxon tribes of Northern Europe. But then the Roman Empire began to crumble and the Romans withdrew from Britain. With the Romans gone, the Germanic tribes, the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, and Frisians quickly sailed across the water, did away with the Celts, and formed kingdoms in the British Isles. For several centuries, these tribes lived in Britain, and their Germanic language, Anglo-Saxon, became the common language, what we call Old English. Although modern English speakers may think Old English sounds like a different language, if you look closely, you'll find many words that are recognizable. For example, here's what the Lord's Prayer looks like in Old English. At first glance, it may look unfamiliar, but update the spelling a bit and you'll see many common English words. So the centuries passed with Britons happily speaking Old English. But in the 700s, a series of Viking invasions began, which continued until a treaty split the island in half. On one side were the Saxons, on the other side were the Danes, who spoke a language called Old Norse. As Saxons fell in love with their cute Danish neighbors and marriages blurred the boundaries, Old Norse mixed with Old English, and many Old Norse words like freckle, leg, root, skin, and want are still a part of our language. 300 years later, in 1066, the Norman conquest brought war again to the British Isles. The Normans were Vikings who had settled in France. They had abandoned the Viking language and culture in favor of a French lifestyle, but they still fought like Vikings. They placed a Norman king on the English throne, and for three centuries, French was the language of the British royalty. Society in Britain came to have two levels, French-speaking aristocracy and old English-speaking peasants. The French also brought many Roman Catholic clergymen with them who added Latin words to the mix. Old English adapted and grew as thousands of words flowed in, many having to do with government, law, and aristocracy. Words like council, marriage, sovereign, govern, damage, and parliament. As the language expanded, English speakers quickly realized what to do if they wanted to sound sophisticated they would use words that had come from French or Latin. Anglo-Saxon words seem so plain, like the Anglo-Saxon peasants who spoke them. Let's go back to the few sentences you thought about earlier. When you pictured the hearty welcome, did you see an earthy scene with relatives hugging and talking loudly? Were they drinking beer? Were they wearing lumberjack shirts and jeans? And what about the cordial reception? I bet you pictured a far more classy and refined crowd blazers and skirts, wine and caviar. Why is this? How is it that phrases that are considered just about synonymous by the dictionary can evoke such different pictures and feelings? Hearty and welcome are both Saxon words. Cordial and reception come from French. The connotation of nobility and authority has persisted around words of French origin and the connotation of peasantry, real people, salt of the earth, has persisted around Saxon words. Even if you never heard this history before, the memory of it persists in the feelings evoked by the words you speak. On some level, it's a story you already knew, because whether we realize it consciously or only subconsciously, our history lives in the words we speak and hear. So this video, it pretty much sums up uh, you know, beautifully today's lecture, how, you know, we are going to discuss uh, the influx of different influences. And uh, you know, just to go a little more into details, 
very beginnings uh you know celts that were the britons and the gaels they were the original inhabitants of england or by extension you can say great britain and uh then uh roman conquest happened that was back in 55 bc and uh, it went on i mean the roman people continued to stay on uh there till 407 ad then there was this anglo saxon invasions uh it was a couple of times, not just one so uh, repeated invasions uh that took place from uh, 407 ad to 787 ad then the viking invasions that continued from 787 ad to 1066 ad and then eventually the norman conquest uh happened uh it happened in 1066 ad and uh norman conquest that actually marks the end of the old english period all right so we're going to take this a little more into uh consideration and uh, for uh, your convenience for you to remember i have uh, you know coined an acronym c r a v n so you can actually remember the chronology in which you know the influences came into the english language and they got built up right so quickly the earliest of the inhabitants like you saw in the video as well were the celts including the britons and gaels and you know uh, the word britons uh, you know that you know instantly bring mind that perhaps you know, it was the britons that uh, britain was named named after and that is a true story yes it was britons after whom britain was named right so you have to remember this point uh, norman conquest marks the end of the old english period like i said before and uh, from the 5th century onwards we find massive migration of celts and gaels to this particular island that we call uh, great britain so remember celts the original inhabitants right and we also note that this island was repeatedly invaded by romans why because rome that was world's most dominant empire back in those times and you know it had the most dominant military force uh you know it it came to england uh, for expansion and uh, their invasions uh, in england they were not very aggressive in nature and uh, you know they very peacefully coexisted with this uh, with these celts uh, celts who were already residing there uh, in england um great britain by extension because you know scotland and wales is also so close and you know uh, there is a good chance that even celts were there as well so uh it was a very peaceful coexistence romans and celts and this peaceful coexistence uh you know uh, during that time why was it that that they it was so peaceful in nature because you know these roman people they celts with a sense of security because they were military uh, uh, very very powerful uh, on the military front and uh, they made camps later military camps that uh, you know uh, um that word uh, you know the emergence of towns uh, mostly romanized towns in england and they also ensured that a good infrastructure was in place there so you know they they want the aggressive types but in a very uh, their presence was then very constructive for the celts so they were existing happily with each other very peacefully so um Anglo-Saxon period which is also the old English period this begins after the Romans right with the arrival of Anglo-Saxons uh it is important to note that the nation gets the name from um Angle land you know it's it's uh um uh, more of an Anglo uh you know origin the name Angle land and which later evolved into England right why were the romans forced to leave in the first place like even in the video it was mentioned that you know the roman empire it began to crumble what was exactly happening back in that time that made romans uh, withdraw their legions from england uh, and and the neighboring countries wales and scotland they had a very practical reason to do that uh, you know there's this tribe visigoths a very violent germanic invading tribe they were attacking rome uh and you know uh, roman empire was a very huge empire stretching from i think turkey and then ending in the british towards the british isles so it was like huge stretch 
right so when he, uh, they were under attack by the visigoths you know if you read uh, the history of roman empire uh, you would know that you know towards the end the actually defeated the roman empire they brought them down and you know that marks the end of the roman empire the fall of the roman empire the invasions of the visigoths so what happened when visigoths had uh, invaded the roman empire somewhere around i think Uh, the black sea around turkey so uh, more and more people were needed uh, uh, to surmount that invasion so uh, the romans had to withdraw their army and you know they had to deploy their army at places where visigoths were mostly active so you know that uh, marked uh, you know the the you know in a way Uh, the romans they shifted back uh, they uh, regressed back uh, eastward and uh, you know england was now vulnerable to attack because uh, with romans uh, the military protection that they had it was gone so um, the, you know the celts heavily relied on the protection and guidance uh, which they had been receiving from the roman army because those were the times when the invading tribes could come and land on any fertile soil and they could even use up the land and overthrow the in- original inhabitants from any land so celts were being protected by romans but with romans uh, leaving uh, england celts were now england was now vulnerable to attack attacks of several uh, you know invading tribes from around um, from from france from uh, you know uh, scandinavian nations norway and sweden is really nearby so Uh, so once uh, romans leave they are under attack uh, and we find tribes from different areas invading the british isles right so there were two important invading tribes after the romans left the one uh, one is picts and the other scots uh, who arrives in england from the north and also from ireland so you know, these tribes were coming from scotland and ireland and they were attacking england right in the absence of romans now because the military strength the military prowess was all you know dissolved with the going away of the romans making england vulnerable to attack so these picts and scots they invaded england so at this point angles saxons and jutes these were three invading germanic tribes remember they were germanic right so they brought they actually are responsible for bringing german influence into England and subsequently English language, right? So you have to remember that you know these were Germanic tribes. You know they arrive, and they protect England from the impending attack attack of the Picts and Scots. So you know, at one point they were very uh, they were welcomed these Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. They were welcomed by Celts. Why? Because they were helping uh, the Celts fight the Picts and Scots. You know, but. Uh, and and these angles saxons and jutes they actually initially arrived as mercenaries from eastern coast of europe uh, and they were welcomed by the celts in the beginning as the angles jutes they offered defense against the invading tribes of picts and scots so help of one or two or three different invading tribes to uh, you know to to uh, defend themselves against uh, another set of invading tribes so this is what you know ha- was happening uh, with the celts back in that time and but this uh, was actually a strategic political mistakes by celts why because uh, you know uh, these invading tribes that they had to defend themselves they took over uh, the land uh, england and they themselves settled this island and they spread ac- across northumbria mercia east anglia and wessex these were the parts of england i will show you here in this map northumbria mercia east anglia and wessex you know they you know this is these arrows they show the influx of anglo saxons and jutes into uh, england and uh, you know what they did they themselves settled there and they pushed the celts uh, you know they completely displaced the celts they were driven to the mountain areas and you know they were pushed to areas like cornwall ireland scotland wales 
so on and so forth so they were displaced kelts who you know kelts first thought that all right you know angle these Ang- uh, anglo saxons and jutes they are going to defend us but uh, you know taking their help is going to be beneficial for us that is what they thought uh, because you know uh, they were helping fight the picts and scots but you know this was a huge mistake because this was a huge mistake why because they were they themselves got displaced in this process by anglo saxons and jutes and they migrated in you know um in a large number to england and um uh, thus with uh, you know their mass migration Uh, came the german influence into english language right and uh, uh, there are a uh, few celtic language that that are now in minority why because you know celts were pushed to uh, the status of being a minority tribe so uh, these uh, celtic languages are cornish welsh and scottish gaelic right this is very important from net point of view so you must remember this and uh, one question that came to my mind when i was reading all this why was england preferred by the invading tribe so much the reason for this is that it was safe because it was an island you know it was cut from all other nations so you know it was very much protected as compared to the other um, nations uh, in europe uh, which had neighboring boundaries with other nations and you know tribes would often come very conveniently and they would invade the country and take over so uh, the british isles uh, in that sense very protected area was a very safe area so these uh, you know all the invading tribes they preferred uh, you know going to that place because uh, building a civilization there was a good uh, idea uh, you know from safety point of view and also uh, england in those times was very fertile and uh, you know uh, fertile land favors agriculture and back then uh, you know the, the society uh was uh, largely agrarian there weren't industries so uh, agri- agriculture was a big uh you know deciding factor if our land was uh good uh for survival good for uh establishing a civilization so the reason why england was preferred by these invading tribes so uh this uh launches us Uh, into the conversation of king arthur it's it's a very good time to introduce this character and before i speak anything about him there is something that i want you to see here lies arthur king who was and king who will be so reads the inscription on king arthur's gravestone in thomas mallory's the bot d'artour writing in the 15th century mallory couldn't have known how prophetic this inscription would turn out to be king arthur has risen again and again in our collective imagination along with his retinue of knights winnever the round table camelot and of course excalibur But where do these stories come from and is there any truth to them King Arthur as we know him is a creation of the later middle ages but his legend actually has its roots in celtic poetry from an earlier time the saxon invasion after the romans left britain in 1410 saxon invaders was Thank you. 
Cobbled together fragments of myth and poetry, the contents of the almost complete now in official Suraya, no one understands the video because it, there's a bad connection and we can hear nothing and no one is understanding. Is there a bad yes, connection? Sir. Can you hear me? Yes, it's in and out. I think I think it, you have a, yes, I think you have a bad network uh, uh, because no one understands it. All right, I'll just skip uh, the videos then, uh, Your Highness. I think I should just skip uh, to the explaining part. Uh, do you yes. know me? Uh, yes, we know, we, we understand you. We, are, we hear you very well. All right, all right. So I, I won't play the videos. Um, so I'll just uh, skip to the explaining. So mm -hmm. uh, King Arthur, uh, now is a good time to introduce him. So uh, said to have uh, lived during the 15th and early six, uh, sorry, 5th and the 6th century BC. And uh, he uh, is said to have united the Celtic inhabitants of that time and uh, had led the defense of Britain against the Anglo-Saxon invaders, right? So he uh, united uh, the Celts and he uh, waged a war against these invading Anglo-Saxons to protect Celts, right? You have to remember this part about King Arthur. And, um, and obviously we know that, uh, you know, this war was lost, why? Because then we see the coming of uh, Anglo-Saxons and uh, them settling uh, in large numbers, right? So these legends and folklores about him found uh, in, uh, you know, they're found in medieval histories. And uh, as mentioned in the video, uh, though I'm not sure if you were able to hear it or not, but uh, in the 1130s, there was this poet, Jeffrey of Monmouth. He created a literary persona of King Arthur, right? So this uh, poet then becomes important because he's the first person to introduce King Arthur into literature, 
right so some argue that uh, you know he may be a half a, a forgotten celtic deity who was worshiped during these times because uh, you know uh, no mention um, uh, was found in the anglo-saxon chronicle you know they a chronicle uh, back uh, you know about those times the anglo-saxon times the anglo-saxon chronicles so some say that you know perhaps he was a deity some says uh, that you know he was uh, genuinely a warrior a king who led a war waged a war against uh, you know these um, anglo-saxons uh, uh, you know with the celts so you know uh, but whatever uh, uh, you know the history is he is a very important figure because time and again he appears or his influence uh, in some or the other way you find uh, mentioned uh, in the literature uh, of the times that were to you know come uh, after you know Geoffrey of Monmouth uh, made a literary persona out of him uh, so um, then you know one can safely say that he uh, is the most important historical uh, figure uh, but somehow he is not mentioned uh, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that actually you know, leads us to question whether he was really there or was it just a construction? Is he just a construction of our imagination, right? So stories of King Arthur, they offer a lot of insight into the life during the Celtic times and the life of England even before the Anglo-Saxons arrived in England. So you know, this is one purpose that these stories about King Arthur uh, you know, this is what they do. They tell a lot about the life of those times, of the Celtic times before the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons in England. So, you know, uh, later, why are they called Anglo-Saxons and why not Anglo-Saxon Jutes? Because even Jutes were pushed into, uh, pushed to periphery, right? So, uh, and you know, uh, uh, Excalibur and the Round Table, these are the terms that are, you know, even contemporaneously, they are used. Uh, Excalibur is also, uh, you know, the, the model name uh, of a bike. If you, you know, I think it's Bajaj Excalibur, right? And then the round table is often mentioned uh, time and again in literature. So uh, all these are from the Arthurian legends, right? And uh, this video game, King Arthur, uh, you know, the legend of the sword, this is also, you know, a game on PS4. So this is enough proof that, you know, uh, the legend of King Arthur, it continues to uh, intrigue people, even in the contemporary times. People are, uh, you know, interested in this, uh, in the stories of King Arthur, in the stories of round tables and you know, Queen uh, Guinevere and Lancelot and their love triangle and, you know, the different um, qualities that these knights, they, uh, you know, were representative of. So, Okay, moving on. So when these Anglo-Saxon period, uh, you know, when these Anglo-Saxon pe uh, people, they arrived in England, what did they do to England? They actually established five kingdoms that is called Heptarchy. That is Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, Wessex, and Kent. I hope my voice is audible to everybody now and there is no issue. Uh, is it? Am I? Yes, ma'am. It's audible. All right, great. So, you know, this is what they did. They created a heptarchy, right? And uh, there were more, four dialects uh, uh, during uh, that time. Number one, Northumbrian, uh, which was the first one to produce any kind of oral literature, right? So it was towards the north. If you remember the map that I presented to you, Northumbria is on the north, right? So, you know, Northumbria, the word itself, you know, is, is suggestive of northern area, right? So you must remember that the oral traditions, they, uh, uh, you know, they started uh, in the northern areas of England. Then there was this Mercian uh, dialect. Then there was this Kentish that was towards the south. If you look uh, at the map of England, Kent is towards the south of England. And then the West Saxon, right? And West Saxon, it gets more supremacy over the other four, uh, other three dialects. Why? Because uh, it was also the uh, language of King Arthur, West Saxon dialect. All right. So this is to be remembered. And uh, literature in those times was prevalent as both oral traditions and in written format as well. And poetry flourished in the north and prose 
was available mostly in the south right so north was more popular for poetry and south more popular for uh, the prose right so this brings us to the discussion of king king alfred the great so he was actually the king of wessex wessex area and uh, from 871 to 899 ad right so this was the reigning period of king alfred the great and uh, you know wessex was the strongest among all the five kingdoms the heptarchy and uh, united the provinces under the supremacy all right so uh, king alfred was the king who united all these five kingdoms under his supremacy right so he can very safely be called you know a very uh, you know strong anglo-saxon king right so he then um, uh, was a very important political figure uh, why because he led the british army against the viking invasions uh, so who exactly were these vikings uh, vikings were actually a group of ruthless and very violent invaders and they were quite dreaded people were you know very much scared of them uh you know at the time and they were usually associated with war conquest and violence and they continuously invaded britain so you know vikings uh you know they they were a very interesting tribe or so you know history tells us why because you know they weren't um uh, very interested in settling uh at places where they hit they were like okay we're going to hit it we're going to plunder that place and we're going to uh, recede so you know it was never done uh, with an intent lies uh, civilizing purposes or you know the construction of a civilization it was just you know they were violent in nature tells about them so so you know uh, it was king alfred who united all the five kingdoms of anglo saxon times uh, and waged war against vikings and uh, you know in a way what he le- he he did was nation building uh against a single against a common enemy right so uh there were three viking invasions in anglo-saxon period uh in 1787 1866 and uh, during the seven second invasion uh they descended in east anglia there was a little you know spelling mistake here they descended in east anglia uh also advanced to wessex that is you know towards the west successfully they drove out king alfred uh you know sorry they were successfully driven out by king alfred as he united all the kingdoms against their attacks so these vikings they were trying to get into uh england uh, to the interiors of it but they were driven out by king alfred right so in that sense you know king alfred is very important anglo-saxon king because he was able to defend uh, the anglo-saxon england from these uh, you know violent and brutal vikings uh, i had a little video about vikings which now i'm not going to play because uh, bad connection perhaps so i'll just uh, i'll i'll share the ppt with you guys uh, later on and then later uh, it'll be available for you to view so i will quickly skip over to the discussion ahead so king alfred then you know he styles himself as the king of anglo-saxon because there is no other figure in old england old english period who was capable of uniting all the kingdoms together right so he also introduced a new code of conduct for the anglo-saxons to abide by and he was a great patron of education art and literature and he was always encouraging people encouraging uh you know all the literary personas to Uh, write and to translate works and to compile work something that would survive into posterity right so you know these vikings uh you all must have seen uh, avengers and you all must have you know you all must be aware of the figure thor odin loki they are actually uh, figures from norse mythology and you know these vikings uh, you know norse mythology is associated to people uh these viking people so when they were continuously invading britain norse influence norse you know uh, uh, uh some certain words from their uh mythology you know uh, their influence they just entered england they entered uh, these influences entered english language right and uh, and uh, 
the reason we have uh, you know certain uh, words uh, today in english like thursday it's actually you know it has a scandinavian norse influence how because it's thursday thursday so you know it's a day of thor so reason the reason thursday is called thursday thursday it again has a scandinavian influence the norse influence you know the influence of the vikings so you know this is how you know influences they find their way into different languages by you know the reason we are studying uh, socio political circumstances of england to understand how certain words how certain influences they they entered uh, mainstream english right so okay moving on uh, christianity also you know in these times it finds fertile soil in the na- land of the anglo saxons by 597 ad with the conversion of king ethelbert into christianity thus leaving a long legacy of churches and christianity you know earlier it was all pagan but because e- uh, king ethelbert he converted into christianity and uh, you know so england then uh, started converting uh, you know the masses in england they started converting into christianity and it largely became a christian nation and in 1876 britain falls into hands of danes uh, a group of tribes from denmark and norway right and they ended up occupying most of mercia east anglia and northumbria right so they introduced into england what we call dane law so this dane law is a code of conduct that these danes introduced when they came to england when you know they attacked england when they invaded england they did not have any worthy successors these danish peoples these danes so uh, their rule it ends with the norman conquest so norman conquest actually you know uh, this was a conquest that was led on by uh, william uh, the conqueror of normandy the reason i asked you to look at normandy in uh, you know that french map because that is important that is where you know the people are coming from to invade england and later they uh, established their aristocracy in england and that is uh, you know when the french influence in english starts right so it was a uh, norman conquest is also called the battle of hastings and uh, it took place in 1066 and it also marks the end of the old english period right so and many legal terms uh, that we know today they have actually entered from danes law uh, and you know um, they have survived into modern day english and uh, battle of hastings marks the end of anglo saxon period like i mentioned again and then i have been reiterating it and beginning of french rule and influence in england okay so events in 1066 so there was this battle of Stram- uh, stamford that took place um, the battle uh, between england and norwegian army you know norway had waged war against england under the rule of the danish king right so you know all these invading tribes they had uh, invaded somewhere on the north uh, in the northern area so you know while uh, you know the armies were busy uh, you know tackling the invasion in the northern area uh, what these french people these people from normandy did uh, under the ages of uh, william the conqueror they attacked the southern part and you know back in those times traveling from north and south it was not very convenient it was you know we did not have planes we did not have fast mode of transport back in those days so you know uh, and even the soldiers were war weary because they had just uh, prevented a war uh, sorry just invented uh, just prevented an invading uh, you know um, tribe from entering england so it was very uh, difficult for them to uh, you know shift their army immediately southwards and which actually you know it it gave these uh, people from normandy these uh, uh william the conqueror uh, you know a military advantage and they conquered england and this marks the beginning of french rule in england so you know uh, so william the conqueror he was the one uh, f- uh, from you know the french side and uh, the danish king in england uh was harald godwin's son who got defeated and uh, you know which marks the beginning of french rule so a very quick look into old english literature i'm going to be very brisk because most of the important parts i have explained already so literature was mostly oral in nature and in terms of written prose and poetry there is only a handful of texts which have survived 
right so uh, like it was mentioned in the video as well that um, you know not many texts have survived into posterity so we whatever history we construct out of these remaining texts these are not you know you cannot state them as facts these are constructs these are you know uh, narratives that one uh, can conjecture from the available documents right and uh, the subject matter uh, of of the of the literature from this old english period that is actually you know uh, uh, that had a uh, pre- uh, pagan and christian subject matter it had discussions of war conquest and territorial disputes and it spoke about trials and tribulations of daily life so very much of you know uh, very much about what was happening back in those times literature was all about that and we quickly move on to the discussion of beowulf this is very important so um, uh, there is this character beowulf um, it is actually about you know the the titular character beowulf he is actually a scandinavian warrior who was destined to become the king of gates uh, gates were the swedish tribe during those times so you know and uh, how this uh, warrior beowulf he has three major trials in the course uh, of the narrative um, one is uh, the story begins with the battle with the monster that uh, monster with the name grendel followed by an attack with grendel's mother and then years later uh, the hero beowulf is again confronted by a dragon so there are three uh, different characters that beowulf fights one is grendel then grendel's mother and then a dragon this is to be remembered it has been asked in several competitive exams right and uh, because it has so many supernatural characters and supernatural subjects so you know uh, it allows the audience to suspend their beliefs and listen to a narration so what do you mean by suspension of disbelief that you you know let go of your doubts that you know this is this probably just can't happen you know suspension you suspend your disbelief to enjoy a work of art and suspension of disbelief is is a term that was later uh, introduced by st coleridge uh, when he was uh, you know delivering lecture on shakespeare so you know in in order to enjoy a work of art you have to suspend your disbelief of you know a certain occurrence that okay this is unlikely to happen uh, why to be able to enjoy a work of art all right so it was also made into a 2007 movie that actually you know reflects a contemporary interest into uh, contemporary interest in this uh, text in this verse in this old english verse right there is also a little summary a video that i had put in uh, for for you to watch later and uh, again even beowulf has been made into a uh, you know um, a game that was available on sony psp right so old english poetry so you know cadiman and cynewulf these were two dominant uh, figures um, uh, you know in terms of when when, it, when we talk about poetry there were there were these two dominant uh, figures from the old english period and uh, their poetry has a lot of christian elements built into them and it indicates the composition after conversion of the anglo-saxons into christianity so again if you find less of pagan elements and more of christian elements obviously you know you can locate the text in a certain time period right and the themes of their poetry was you know were mostly biblical and religious in nature and uh, cadiman's only uh, you know uh, known surviving work is cadiman's hymn it is actually a nine line alliterative vernacular praise poem in honor of god which he reportedly learned to sing in his dream so you know the idea of you know poetry it has a divine inspiration i think it comes in with uh, cadiman's hymns because you know it it was cadiman uh, receiving uh, uh, learning to sing in his dream so you know dream having a divine inspiration and then you know um, uh you know later that idea that uh, resonated throughout uh, you know the conceptualization of poetry that you know where is it coming from what influence does it have and uh, why should it be valued in society because it has divine inspirations so um and cinewolf uh, he was actually uh, no uh, a few uh, poems again they were very christian in nature the fates of the apostles uh juliana 
Aline and Christ too, also referred to as the Ascension. So it was all about Christ and his crucifixion and what happened to the apostles later after his passing away. And then quickly we move over to uh, Deor, the Lament of Deor, which is a very important work from old uh, period, from old English period. Uh, you know, mostly uh, whatever poems uh, which have been di discovered from at that time, they are anonymous. So even this is anonymous composition, which is actually a poem of 42 lines. And it is actually about the complaints of a minstrel who, after years of service to his Lord, was replaced by a rival. So it is a very personal poem uh, in that sense. And it is actually, you know, it, he compares his current predicament to the predicaments of figures from Anglo-Saxon folklore. So, you know, there is a uh, blending in of folklore as well into this work and it actually throws light into daily lifestyle of old English period and also gives a glimpse of old Germanic times and uh, again like I said it has a personal touch to poetry which was very uncommon back in those time because it was you know poetry mostly dealt with supernatural beings warriors and you know biblical subjects so on and so forth so something of you know personal in nature was very you know, new, was very novel in that time. So another poem, The Dream of the Rude, right? Again, a rude is the cross, right? So Dream of the Cross, again, a religious poem. So it is again a short poem and it is a predominant example of religious poetry, again, anonymous origin. And it primarily ta talks about events of crucifixion in a very symbolic way. And the entire story is narrated by a participant who witnesses the act of crucifixion. All right, so there's somebody who has witnessed crucifixion uh, who is narrating this poem. So uh, a cross appears in the, uh, all right. Um, a cross um, appears in a dream and in the cross, um, you know, th this cross has a symbolic element. The cross begins to address the dreamer himself, right? The cross shares its accounts of Jesus's death. So it talks about Jesus's death. The crucifixion story is told from the perspective of the cross on which you know uh, Jesus was uh, you know, crucified. It begins with the enemy coming to cut the tree down and carrying it away, the tree that was later made into the cross, right? So the tree learns that it is not to be the bearer of a criminal, but it is actually going to be the bearer of Christ, the son of God. The Lord and the cross become one during the narration of the poetry and they stand together as victors, refusing to fall, talking on insurmountable uh, talking of insurmountable pain for the sake of uh, you know mankind and it is not just Christ but the cross as well that is pierced with nails so you know the idea of cross along with Christ being the sufferer here so you know this is the poem uh, the dream of the root this is what it's all about and then we have the Exeter book this is a very important book it is actually an anthology of Anglo-Saxon poetry and it came into being in 970 AD and uh, why is it called the Exeter book it was actually donated to the library of Exeter Cathedral by a person named Leofric and uh, this guy, Leofric, he was actually the first bishop of Exeter in 1072. And, you know, back then churches and monasteries, they were the centers of learning and education, art and everything. And they were responsible for preservation of texts and, uh, you know, whatever important documents of those times. So it was donated. This book was donated to uh, the cathedral. Uh, so, you know, um, so that you know it survives into posterity and uh, it is believed originally to have contained 131 leaves of which the first eight have been replaced with other leaves because the original eight pages have been lost so you know, there is idea of you know these pages being lost these archives being lost that gives us a very incomplete picture of the history of those times and in 2016 unesco recognized the book as one of the world's principal cultural artifacts so this is one a very important book and it contains major poems, The Wanderer, The Seafarer, The Wife's Lament, The Husband's Message, The Ruin, along with 95 riddles with considerable literary skills, right? So there, there is this explanation of... My apologies, uh, Professor. May we just request that everybody mutes their mics so they don't disturb you. May everybody please mute their mics so we do not have feedback. Thank you very much. Apologies for that, ma'am. It's okay. Uh, I'm just about to wrap the session. I think I have another three minutes with me because uh, there is a session right after this, uh, if I'm not wrong. Right? So, yes, yes, there is. 
So I will continue. Her Royal Highness has gone to open that, so I think you are able to continue. Yeah. So um, uh, a little bit more about uh, you know these poems that I just spoke about, the Wanderer, the Seafarer. These are actually are poems that are considered almost as old or, uh, as Beowulf, and they have significant religious allegory. And the Wanderer is about the lament of a solitary man who was once happy, person living a joyful life, and you know that life. Uh, you know how his life is undergoing a transition after his lord's death and how he laments about the passing away of the earlier times of happiness friendship and companionship so you know this poem is nostalgic in nature and when we uh, talk about uh, seafarer it is actually a monologue of an old soldier who talks about you know loneliness and hardships of life at sea but then at the same times you know he continues to be in awe and fascination of you know the adventure that the life at sea has to offer so these two poems uh, this is the subject matter of these two poems and then we have the discussion of the anglo-saxon prose and uh, you know uh, if you remember how i told you that king alfred was a uh, you know uh he was a big patron of arts and architecture and you know, literature education and everything so you know he was into preserving a lot of prose work and he uh, it's it's uh, said uh, that you know he especially learned latin to convert Lat uh, you know latin texts into vernacular english so uh, in that sense uh, you know he has contributed heavily to anglo saxon prose so uh, i will wrap today's session so what we learned today was uh, uh, we learned about the early in, uh, earliest inhabitants of england about the socio political factors that were responsible for the influx of different uh, you know um words and influences into english language sorry this is just hasty work so uh, we learned about the legend of king arthur and uh, king alfred and his uh, contributions to english literature he was a patron of art literature education and we learned about beowulf and old english poetry and prose uh, in the sec uh, in the second session we are going to take up uh, the middle english period we're going to talk about the father of english poetry chaucer geoffrey chaucer and the time that is uh, you know um, the time that is right before uh, the elizabethan period so uh i'll stop sharing the screen now and um